it doesn't matter where you are in your life story, God can rescue you from shame. I'm not sure what just happened just now, but I hope it's continuing. If not, we'll pick up from where we pick up in the, in the mid air. So um, many people in this world, we, we live in a world where we see a lot of people rise to shame. Uh, rise to pain and they come from nowhere oftentimes and sometimes they forget where they're coming from sometimes they're lost in the midst of their fame and their lives just end in shame first samuel 31 tells us about someone's life who end just that way before we do that we're going to quickly look at some reaction to shame and the reactions to shames are different shame are different and uh, and we see how people we see it every day we do it also ourselves the experience of shame with its sense of exposure, inferiority, and confusion and weakness is such a painful one that individuals learn to defend against it, to avoid experiencing it. And sometimes we block it out and pretend it's not there. And that is not a good reaction to shame. It's almost any effect feels, you know, better than shame. Um, the notion of defensive scripts helps to describe the way in which people develop habitual ways of thinking and behaving so that they can avoid shame. Now, these scripts are performed or activated when shame threatens our lives. And Nathan, Nathanson in 1992, um, in page 312, suggests that um, there are four basic defensive scripts against shame. And I'm going to look at those briefly. And at the, the, at the north point of the compass, um, Nathanson places withdrawal and that's what we do that's what almost everybody do when we are faced with shame or trauma we withdraw when we feel with a difficult situation at work and I was saying to someone I find myself withdrawing and someone said to me I can see your light going out your your your, your energy is going and I, and, and, I, and I feel it myself you know when we see on a, a, a certain situation that we don't want to be a part of that we see it's a waste of time and waste of energy you withdraw from the situation that's going around and and while at the south is avoidance so we, we do both and a, and a part of and it's a, there's a kind of correlation between the two in my mind uh, at the eastern point lies the defense of attack self and, and i was talking to someone and she was saying you know i am so kind to everybody else but i i i i, I inflict myself with I, I turn the rot against myself and a lot of people do self-attack and self-harm as a result of shame and they want to they think life is not worth living anymore. And I just want to give someone hope this morning. There is hope and you are worth it. And, and this is opposed at the Western point, which is um, by attacking others. So some people, which is why we have bullies, they attack others because of their own shame and in, in, in efficiencies that they're dealing with. And at the withdrawal end, you know, withdrawal can be literal and physical and of psychological and internal. I remember this person saying to me, um, I, I, I'm doing well by myself, it's crowded, I, I can't do crowd because they feel judged by the, the crowd around them, you see. So when shame arouses memories that arouse that shame is anticipated, a person seeks to defend themselves from the experience by withdrawing to safety. This occurs on a spectrum that ranges from momentarily gaze avoidance to, to prolonged isolation and depression. The duration and intensity of withdrawal varies according to individuals and circumstances. The withdrawal response is often accompanied by distress and fear, which is interpreted as depression. People who habitually act out the withdrawal script of adaptation to shame may appear to be depressed rather than chronically shamed. They can be very difficult to help and to relate to and to relate to because of this. Then we, we, we often find people attacking themselves. We see self-harm in them. You know, they look at people, their arms are so well, their necks are so well, that many times they try to kill themselves. Some people pinch themselves to bleed to death. You know, a self-attack like withdrawal attack self can be a useful and healthy response to shame if it's only briefly and mildly in evidence, said Nathan Swack. I don't know about that, but, you know, it's good to, to feel that you've done something wrong. I guess that's what he's saying. And what he's saying is that, you know, but if this is prolonged where you start to self-harming, it becomes dangerous. A little self-attacking can be seen as a sign of appropriate difference, conformity and self-effacement or modesty. It can enhance social relationship and affinity. If this response becomes habitual, however, it is destructive. It is distressing to see someone ritually humiliating themselves or constantly putting themselves down or, or, or just self-harming, as I said, this can cut individuals off from wider social relations. And is one thing, uh, he's talking about words here, you know, but people physically self-harm. Uh, and the chronic attack self-response to shame can be related to fundamental um, masochism. Uh, masochism is not to, to be understood a love of pain for its own sake, nor a sexual um, uh, perversion. Instead, it is a, a creation solution to the infantile problem of trying to relate to a needed and powerful other. 
It represents the attempt to retain attachment to hostile or persecutory objects. And we see a lot of people in, in when they've been abused or intimate relations that are violent, they tend to go back to the abusers and, and they make excuse. It, children is not a reason to stay in abuse, okay? A lot of people do that. And when the children leave or get grown enough and the children are damaged by what they see in these relationships because they see the constant of the abuse that's us attributed to each other. And that child themselves becomes an abuser or allow themselves to be abused because of either they see a parent accepting it or they see a parent inflicting it. Um, and mathachism, which may be understood as the acting out of the attack self-script, is the need usually for compulsive to seek suffering and pain in order to obtain love and respect. And a lot of people say, I deserve it. It's how I am the one who caused him to do this to me. No such story. That person is sick and in need of help. And to sabotage one's chances and success. And, you know, I was talking to somebody oh. again, and, you know, and, you know, and they kept saying that I'm sabotaging myself, but they could not bring themselves for stop um, sabotaging themselves. And I'm going to stop here because in the interest of time because I know the emotions are a bit long, but I'm going to make them go because I know that they're useful for those who want to spend the time to listen. I hope someone is blessed. And um, the story I want to talk to you about this morning is the story of Saul. And we see God, um, God gave the people a king based on what they were looking for, based on their ideas, someone tall and, and look, looking kingly and sitting with broad shoulder and looking like the kings of the nations around them. And we see that Saul didn't have a true heart for God. You know, the spirit of God came upon him and he was different. He, was, he wasn't he was accepting of the position of a king because when, when it was time for his coronation, he disappeared and was nowhere to be found. And, you know, Saul, unlike David, you know, David had a passion for the Lord and the Lord was with Saul and, and Samuel will tell him things, but Saul from time to time took things on himself to the point where Saul got rid of the witches of, of, of Endos and he himself went to look for them when he was one of the first person that the Bible calls a living dead. He was living, but his um, technically his probation closes. The Bible tells you that God wiped him off and while he was living, he was his death sentence was on his head. There was no more hope for him. So his probation closed while he was alive. And some of us think that, you know, it's only when we die our probation closes. And um, that we, we know one safe, always safe. No such thing. The Bible does not preach that. And the Bible tells us that Saul was, while he was living, his the spirit of God left him. And that's why he was so tormented by David had to play the harp for him. But when the spirit of God leave you, no harp or music, no possession. And that's why we see a lot of the music, movie stars and other people who have a lot of possession because they have not God. A lot of them started their singing career in the church and they walk away from God. The one thing that brings hope, the only reason why some of us are standing as Christian is because of hope in God. Some of us would have gone over the edge like everybody else had we not have hope in God. Had we not have hope in the coming of Christ, many of us would have lost the plot just, just the same. And many of us are losing that plot, even with being in the church. And we're just not owning up to it. And this morning, I want to bring hope. And 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 Saul, you know, Saul was so tormented that he was hunting to kill David and to go against God's plan. And when Saul died in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 31, we see that the Philistine, the way the Philistine decapitated them and the way the Philistine treated their body, it was one of shame. Shame and disgrace until someone rescued the bodies and, and gave them a burial. There's no good ending for you when you turn against God. When you turn against God, your ending is bitter. Even if you die in this earth and you die a lavish death, and you know, you cannot take nothing with you, nothing with you. Not even royals take anything with them. They go back to the, you might in a fancy dress and you're gonna be, you know, when that girl died, you know, um, there were so many change of clothes as if she, she had, she should change clothes every day, you know? Um, you hope her, her heart is right with God. You know, no matter how royal they are, they have to give back those grounds. They have to leave them behind them. They cannot take it to them in the grave. The one thing you can take is a surety that if you die in Jesus Christ, you will, no matter how shameful your life is, you will no longer live in shape. You can look forward to the connection and the resurrection where you'll be rise again to a life made new. So irrespective of the life of shame you have, you don't have to die in shame. You don't have to live an end of shame because God wants to give you life anew. Surrender it over to Jesus and let him take you from that shame to fame and not from fame to shame. And Saul's act is not that God left him, but he left God. And as a result, he ended up in a life. God took him from nothing and, and gave him a life of fame. But because he did not put God first and because he made his own choices and he stuck to them and wouldn't surrender them to God, his life ended in a life of shame. So what of a shame you have experienced this morning? Turn him over to Jesus. 
and then you can laugh uh -huh, uh -huh, and smile the rest of the way. Have a blessed day. And Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning for the reminder, God, that we don't have to end our lives and we don't have to live them in, in shame. In respect of the bad choices we make, Lord, we can turn them over to you, Lord, and we can move from shame to faith instead of the reverse. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you will guide those who read this message this morning, that someone will find hope in you, that irrespective of how bad their situation is, if they only turn it over to you, Lord, that you can make the difference and you can transform our brokenness and bring us life, Lord. Help us to focus on life, Lord. I was talking to someone yesterday and they said, you know, we focus so much on our work, life balance, that, you know, we focus on the wrong thing. But when we focus on the life work balance, Lord, we can get it right. When we put Jesus first, when we put the Christ first, you know, we said we'll put Jesus in the middle, but sometimes we put him in the middle and we leave him in the middle. There's no connecting point with the middle and hearts and him, Lord. So Jesus, we ask you to connect our hearts and life to you, Lord, and help us that you will be all of our lives, that you will take all of us and make us all of you. In your name I pray, amen. Have a blessed day, bless, bless. And we just invite the Holy Spirit and ask him to take charge of our days, to guide us as we go on our journey and to help us that we will be a blessing for those we come in contact with. Amen.